So my name is Harvey Whitehouse. I'm uh, a professor at Oxford University. Um, uh, my sort of background has been to uh, try to understand religion scientifically, and it all began for me actually in Papua New Guinea, uh, where I went to do field work for two years, living continuously in the rainforest, uh, going native, learning about people's lives by essentially mucking in and joining in with everyday life. Uh, something that we anthropologists call participant observation. Um, and the idea behind this uh, research initially was to learn how people eke out a living from their forest environment. So I was asking people a lot of questions about production and consumption and exchange and economic things, you know. And people were quite cooperative and helpful, but after a while I could see that their eyes were kind of glazing over a bit and they weren't really enjoying this whole line of questioning and what they really wanted to talk about were their religious ideas and practices and so I became aware increasingly that most of much of people's time was invested performing rituals uh, that were intended to entice the ancestors back from the dead and so um, much of the the religion in this region of Papua New Guinea was premised on the idea that western goods were not made in factories or through any kind of secular process of production, but were the creations of otherworldly beings. And the way to gain access to all that stuff was by performing rituals. So I became really interested in why people have these kinds of belief systems and why they pour so much energy into these ritual traditions. So that's where it all began for me. And, uh, um, and many of the questions that I was eager to answer, I realised could not be um, answered simply by uh, carrying out this sort of long-term participation in people's lives and observing things directly, that it was also necessary to develop carefully controlled experiments to tease apart and separate out some of the uh, crucial causes of the behaviours that I was observing. So I became uh, convinced that the way to do this was collaboratively, first of all with experimental psychologists, um, and I established this Institute of Cognition and Culture at Belfast, uh, Queen's University, Belfast, um, and then subsequently moved to Oxford and set up a similar uh, institute, the Institute of uh, Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology, which emerged out of an earlier uh, centre that we created called the Centre for Anthropology of Mind. Uh, so anyway, I'm now the director of the Institute of Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology in Oxford, um, and uh, two of my former PhD students are the creators of, Le uh, creators of Levnia, this wonderful institution that you set up here in Brno. Well, right now, the uh, Institute of Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology in Oxford is going through a process of growth. We've just acquired a new um, uh, lecturer, um, a permanent position, Emma Cohen, who's, who brings with her her own research interests. And in fact, next week, we're shortlisting for a second permanent position in evolutionary anthropology. And we have yet to uh, discover who that person will be and what research interests they'll have. But currently, we have um, three large grants running into many millions of pounds that are really focused on how to um, understand the relationship between participation in collective rituals and uh, the building of the kind of social glue that holds human groups together, uh, what's sometimes called social cohesion. Um, and we're interested in how those patterns change as we uh, go through deep history from quite small group living to the very large and complex societies that we live in today. And our central question is what role does collective ritual performance play in that grand drama in the sweep of human history that leads from small group living to large complex societies. But let me tell you about a couple of examples of studies. Uh, one element, one component of our project uh, is looking at how young children learn the rituals and conventions of their communities. Um, and uh, so we've done some studies, for instance, with uh, three to, f uh, sorry, four to six year olds um, where we're looking at their ab ability to discriminate between um, actions uh, available for imitation that are modelled to them um, that are uh, best understood as conventional behaviours or best understood as instrumental behaviours. And that distinction is quite important for young children as it becomes in increasingly important 
uh, for older children and for adults, the ability to distinguish between cultural practices that are the way they are because that's the proper and conventional way to do it versus they're that way because that's the most efficient way instrumentally to bring about a desired end goal. And children, it turns out, are very sensitive to that distinction between those two kinds of um, social learning. Um, in our experiments, we uh, um, have children um, interact with a, a group of novel, unfamiliar stimuli, a group, like a set of toys, in effect. Um, and then the model shows them, uh, the, uh, performs an activity using those stimuli. Um, and uh, the experimental manipulation is, uh, in, in one case, in one of our experiments, is to have uh, an end state that is different from the start state. So the objects end up in a different position from the way they were originally. And in the, uh, uh, what we call the ritual condition, um, the objects end up exactly where they were at the beginning. So there's no suggestion even of an end goal. And instead children uh, are invited to uh, consider the possibility that maybe if there's no instrumental end goal, perhaps this is a proper way of behaving, perhaps this is a conventional behaviour. And interestingly what we find is that children um, imitate the modelled behaviour more um, uh, rigidly and they're less prone to inventing or innovating new little games of their own when the end state and start state are identical. So it's one of um, a number of studies that is suggesting to us that children make this distinction between a ritual stance on behaviour and an instrumental stance. And it turns out that when the ritual stance is activated, children uh, would seem to be much more uh, interested in uh, issues of affiliation with other people. Um, and in fact, um, uh, we have a whole series of experiments looking at um, a range of different social cues. This work is being uh, spearheaded by the developmental psychologist Christine Laguerre at uh, the University of Texas at Austin, um, but it's part of our big Oxford project. Another example, I guess, which um, I, I suspect could be quite interesting is the work that we're doing with archaeologists to understand how we get from uh, small hunting and gathering societies to much larger, more complex, settled agricultural societies and what role ritual plays in that process. Um, we have quite a lot of evidence now that um, uh, rituals really come in uh, uh, two main varieties, at least the kinds of rituals that bind groups together come in these two packages, if you like. One package involves uh, very low frequency rituals, that's they're rarely performed, but very intense emotionally. And those rituals, particularly if they're frightening and uh, painful or some combination of, of the two, um, they seem to bind communities together very tightly for long periods of time without needing to be performed repeatedly. Um, there are other sort of rituals that, that are more like parties, that are fun, that are euphoric, pleasant, um, that seem to need to be repeated uh, every year or so, you know, to keep up the effect. Um, but, but so let's think of those as the relatively low frequency but emotionally arousing rituals. And then at the other end of the spectrum, a lot of rituals seem to be quite the opposite. They're very high frequency. We seem to have to do them all the time, maybe weekly, maybe even daily. Um, but they're much less intense emotionally on the whole. This is a generalisation based on looking at literally hundreds and hundreds of rituals from many different language groups. Um, so we've got this pattern. Um, and uh, we think that what happens in uh, the transition from foraging to farming uh, in um, uh, what's now uh, uh, modern Turkey, where we, we have been working at an archaeological excavation called Chattel Huyuk, um, which is bang in the middle of this kind of transition period, that what's happening is a transition from a, a world in which small groups are bound together by relatively rare but emotionally intense rituals into a world where um, people are living in much larger social groups bound together by more frequent repetitive rituals. Um, and having uh, studied these processes at the site of Chattel Huyuk, we're now expanding across the whole region and deeper back into the past and forward 
uh, to the point where we, we begin to see the emergence of really large, complex um, hierarchical societies, we're, we're seeing these patterns unfold on a, on a sort of grander scale, if you like. I think it is possible to predict the future using these kinds of theories. Um, uh, for instance, we're very interested in how um, ritual practices um, shape uh, groups in situations of uh, civil war, armed conflict. So one component of our project, for instance, has focused very heavily on Libya since the um, revolution uh, kicked off last year. Um, and we had a field worker um, based in Misrata throughout the siege watching how people um, formed their social networks, eventually developing what became known in Libya as katibas, which are uh, revolutionary brigades, uh, which formed um, in order to um, uh, prosecute the, the war against Gaddafi and his forces. Um, and uh, what we've learned from the research in Libya is pointing us in all kinds of uh, directions in relation to public policy. Um, it's affording us the opportunity, uh, I think, to offer at least probabilistic um, sorts of accounts of how uh, different kinds of interventions, both during and after conflicts, uh, are likely to impact um, uh, uh, the, the development of, of more stable conditions. Um, one thing is for sure, after the revolution in, in Libya, I went out to Misrata after Gaddafi had been uh, captured and killed, uh, and met with uh, many of the revolutionary leaders and many of the rank-and-file revolutionaries. And there was an incredible sense of euphoria, of commitment to group projects of all kinds. Just to give one example, um, for mile upon mile between Misrata and Tripoli, I saw paving stones that had been painstakingly uh, painted at the curbside in the um, uh, traditional Libyan flag colours. Um, by communities of people so tightly bound together, full of optimism, full of excitement about the future, and above all, thoroughly and deeply committed to each other. And that commitment um, is, is something that you get in the wake of conflicts like this, which is an incredibly powerful resource if it's utilised effectively. In the case of Libya, I don't think that was the case. And, and I think very often after conflicts, there's a, a, a terrible sort of tragedy that, that that sort of commitment to the community is not exploited in the way that it could have been. The main grant um, is a large grant from the Economic and Social Research Council uh, in the UK. And uh, it's, uh, the title of that project is Ritual, Community and Conflict. Um, and that project has three main objectives. The first one I've briefly talked about is uh, the, the, uh, focused on understanding the development uh, through childhood of uh, the ritual stance. So I've told you a little bit about that. The second goal is to understand how rituals, exactly what the mechanisms are by which rituals bind groups together. People have known for a long time that rituals have this effect, but nobody has really nailed down the mechanisms psychologically uh, by which performing rituals in groups leads people to be more bound to one another and, in behavioural terms, uh, ready to cooperate with each other. We're also interested in how it not only binds groups together, but often it does so in competition with other groups, something we, call, we refer to as outgroup hostility, if you like, that, that other groups um, are seen as in competition with your own, and that competition as we saw, for instance, in, in, in Libya, is a, a, can be prosecuted in a violent fashion. Um, so uh, how do, does, you know, in a way, the flip side to being bound together in a group is the potential for this kind of competitive outlook on other groups. So we're trying to understand that um, by conducting carefully controlled experiments in uh, the lab, psychological experiments, where we um, uh, have people perform rituals with different amounts and types of emotional content and we look at the effects of modulating emotional arousal on things like uh, the cohesion of the group and the willingness of participants to cooperate in uh, specially designed games um, as a sort of behavioural measure of their commitment to the group. And in some cases, in some of our experiments, we're looking at how the, the extent to which people will invest resources in harming members of other groups. Uh, so, um, so it's got these multiple dimensions to it, that work. 
Our third objective is, is about looking at um, uh, how rituals have contributed to the building of social groups over long periods of time. So I mentioned very briefly the archaeological research, but we're also building uh, an historical database. And this is a very ambitious element of the project. It involves um, basically trying to divide the entire globe into a set of uh, squares um, that we can then uh, examine the history of, the, the, of, of social groups in those squares over um, the last 5,000 years of recorded history, or as far back as we can go for a given square at 100-year time steps. You can imagine the scale of a problem like that. Um, it's a database that will probably take decades to complete, so we're not uh, expecting this to happen overnight, and it will involve the participation of hundreds and hundreds, possibly thousands of historians uh, by the time it's completed, uh, but of course it never will be completed, it will always be ongoing as new uh, um, uh, uh, materials become available and as new history makes itself. Um, but this historical database um, will also enable us to test some of our predictions uh, in quite the early stages of its development. You don't need to know about the history of the entire world in order to look for patterns in correlational terms between variables of interest. So we can look for correlations in well-described, well-documented uh, regions of the world relatively early in, in the process of developing the database. Um, some of these other projects that I mentioned, some of these other large grants, are really extending um, the work that I've just described uh, rather than introducing novel elements. So the work, uh, so we've just signed the contract on a new uh, grant for about a million pounds that will enable us to test some of our uh, theories that we're currently um, uh, exploring in the lab in Oxford or in London or in other universities where we're carrying out research um, uh, in non-Western settings. So for instance, one very interesting question is whether some of the patterns that we see emerging in early childhood in Western children are also found in non-Western societies where children are not going to school because it's quite possible that some of the things we're interested in could be influenced by formal schooling. Um, uh, there are a number of other projects that we, that we really need to test our uh, hypotheses cross-culturally. So that's one element. Another element to it is being able to look at rituals in large urban environments. And uh, inspired by a, a fascinating uh, project uh, spearheaded by David Sloan Wilson at Binghamton University, in upstate New York, where he's established this massive neighborhood project, we're planning to do the same thing in Singapore so that we can compare the results of studies in America with uh, the same sorts of variables uh, being tested in Singapore and, and compare across the two sites. So the idea of, a, of the Binghamton Neighborhood Project is that we can um, observe both the mechanisms of, um, by which say rituals, for instance, help to uh, um, build group cohesion. Um, but we can also look at how those mechanisms are utilised as a consequence of changing niches for groups. So for instance, um, the niche for religious fundamentalism in a town like Binghamton might uh, be uh, what you could call existential insecurity, the, and that might manifest of, uh, as lack of uh, money, lack of prospects, perhaps lack of uh, insurance to guard against penury and other kinds of threats uh, in the future. A tight social network like a fundamentalist church provides people with a kind of proxy, or with a kind of insurance, I mean not just a proxy, but an actual kind of uh, um, uh, insurance scheme, if you like, not one that you pay premiums into, but you pay it in the form of social capital. You invest in other people who will stand by you when you need it and you in turn have that obligation to them. Um, so we have hypotheses about how ritual groups form in response to needs in a local environment. This is essentially an evolutionary approach to understanding uh, cultural change. If those predictions um, are good for Binghamton, they ought to be good for Singapore as well. So the idea is to be able to compare across these two cities and check that the findings that we get in upstate New York uh, also work in Southeast Asia and, and uh, other regions that uh, the National University of Singapore is connected into and gathering data from. I think what is special about Levener, oh sorry I'm meant to be a different, I think one of the things that's really special about Levener
is its commitment to experimental research. This is, this is important because it enables us to um, control for uh, all kinds of factors that could... Um, uh, um, so, let, so, sorry, let me start again. Can I start again on this one? Okay, I think, let, let me start again because your question was actually about um, field research. Sorry, yeah, so it was. Okay, let me think about how best to answer that. Okay, when I first became interested in religion as a result of my experiences in Papua New Guinea, um, the way that you learned, the way that you tested hypotheses was through direct observation of the world primarily. So the vast majority of religion scholars at the time, whether it was in the anthropology of religion or in comparative religion or history of religions, all these different fields, was essentially to look at detailed case studies as a way of testing hypotheses. The problem with that is that when you compare one group with another, it's impossible to control for any of the con potentially many, many confounding variables. Um, there was no tradition of teasing apart those component features of, uh, of religion that our hypotheses were targeting uh, in a way that um, controlled uh, those, uh, the situation. So what we needed was uh, to develop a, an experimental lab-based approach to these topics. Um, at the time, uh, when I, my interest uh, first began to develop, I was uh, living in, I was working at Cambridge University, and I met the anthropologist uh, uh, Pascal Boyer, and he introduced me to other people who'd been beginning to think about experimental approaches. That was the beginning of it for all of us. Actually, we formed a group of about five or six of us. And uh, we used to joke that we had this kind of, uh, we used to uh, call it a kind of cognitive conspiracy that we were going to uh, develop a set of um, experimental methods and spread these to those involved in the study of religions. And that effectively, although it was a joke, is what's happened. I mean, we've, what we've seen is the emergence of many new institutes around the world focused on this experimental approach to religion. And I think Levenier is one of the, the great examples of this. Um, it's dedicated specifically to that methodology. It doesn't exclude observation. After all, we still need to be able to observe religious behavior in natural settings. We still need to look for correlational patterns among the variables that we're interested in. But if we're to get at the psychological mechanisms, there's no alternative than to go into the lab and to conduct experiments. I think we need to understand some of these issues in broader terms. I mean, um, if you go through some kind of a traumatic ordeal with a group of people and you emerge from it um, unharmed or, or perhaps actually harmed but living with the consequences of that experience. Um, that living with the consequences includes having a detailed memory for the events that you went through and because it was uh, very uh, powerful emotionally um, it becomes part of your self story, it becomes part of your autobiography um, it becomes part of your personal self. And when you uh, encounter other people uh, who share these very salient experiences that are very important to your sense of who you are, you feel a sense of sharing with them that is uh, quite potent. Um, we refer to this as identity fusion, and it's quite now quite a well-studied phenomenon in social psychology. Having being fused with other people in that way has very important consequences for the way you treat them. It makes you more willing to make sacrifices of, of yourself for the group. And in some cases, um, one of the kind of interesting uh, outcomes of identity fusion is a willingness, a, a desire, in fact, to uh, do more than other members of the group uh, in order to ensure that its needs are, are met. And um, I think uh, certain kinds of rituals, particularly in small-scale societies, uh, have been very effective at hijacking that mechanism. How do they do it? Well, they put boys, for instance, through intensely painful and traumatic initiation rituals, or they perform other kinds of rituals that bring the community together in a very intense way. Um, it's, a, it's a very, in a way, it's a, a more efficient method of accomplishing what sometimes takes a lifetime of shared experience to bring about. But I think rituals do it in a, in a particularly uh, uh, clever way. Because rituals are, um, as I explained earlier, these, these kind of opaque actions where the relationship between the components of the action sequence and any kind of uh, end goal, if there is one, uh, 
is opaque, unclear. People don't understand, and they don't even look for a physical causal explanation between those elements. Instead, they look for um, meanings of, of all kinds, symbolic meanings, supernatural meanings, other kinds of meanings, uh, not physical causal explanations. And the process of reflection on the meaning of rituals uh, actually uh, increases, it amplifies this sense of very rich experience and so amplifies also the sense of rich shared experience. Okay, so it actually um, the fact that it's ritualized increases this, this sense of sharing, the volume if you like of sharing with other people. Um, so that's, that's how some rituals bind very small communities together. And as I said, that's, that's primarily in small-scale societies. But we also find that mechanism in military groups of various kinds. And I think the reason for this is that that kind of bonding that rituals are capable of producing um, results in very, very extreme kinds of commitment to the group and, and willingness to pay very high sacrifices for the benefit of the group. If you live in a large-scale society um, where you know, there's some kind of requirement that you uh, treat even strangers that you meet uh, uh, on the street as um, fellow citizens, as having rights like you do, and as part of your ethnic group and your, uh, with a shared history and all the rest of it, um, actually having small groups bound together so tightly uh, could be quite harmful. And actually, a lot of larger societies try to um, tame or, or sort of eliminate even those kinds of intense rituals that bind small groups together. Or they allow them to persist, but only in sort of rarefied environments like the military. We'll let our elite forces bond in that way, but we don't want ordinary people doing it. Um, so, uh, you know, I, th I see things like the European Reformation as just one of many examples of efforts to kind of tamp down rituals that bind people into smaller groups and to emphasize a more standardized body of ideas and practices that encompass a larger group.